Greetings, nerds. This is Cena Nerd. I'm your host, Sarah Belmont, and with me, as always, is our Mr. Producer, Will Paul. How are you doing tonight, Will? Doing very well, Sarah. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. That's good. I did my homework, and I um, about an hour ago, I watched the Spider-Verse short film, The Spider Within. Yeah, yeah. What you think of it? I'm going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I like miles and um so it was good to get something from Mm -hmm. um into the spider-verse spider-verse world and miles and everything and i understand the concept i love that it's with charity i got bored about two minutes in (laughs) Mm. (laughs) if i'm being completely honest for some reason i was just like wow, this is dragging on. It felt longer than eight minutes for me. Huh. Um, so I I love that it works for some people and some people really enjoyed this. Yeah. And again, I think the message is great and um, the concept and why they did this in support of mental health. Um, at the same time, I'm just going to be honest. And for whatever reason, I wasn't like overwhelmed by um, by what it was. Yeah. OK, well, that's fair. I mean, I, you know, was it I, I liked it. I really I, I really thought that the message was, you know, it was truly, uh, for lack of a better term, a PSA for, you know, for mental health awareness and, you know, seeking help for when you're feeling overwhelmed and I thought a lot of the the visuals and things that, you know, were in it as far as when Miles was, you know, having the panic attack and everything. I mean, I thought it really, really did a, you know, a good job of like, you know, really visualizing what, what he was feeling and all the, the pressures that he was, that he was having. So for me, the, 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 the short film worked very, very well. So, I mean, I wasn't, expecting it to be like you know part three of the of the trilogy or whatever but it was just a nice it was a short film and really had really thought it was very very well done so yeah 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 no no that makes sense um and and i'm not putting it down i think it's it's it is eight minutes long to me it felt longer but um i think if you it's worth checking out um, especially if you have watched the two Spider-Verse mm-hmm. movies and have been following Miles' story. Yeah. I think it's just a nice little appetizer um, for in the meantime, as we continue not to get the third movie, which was supposed to come out in March, but I told yeah. Will that there's no way in hell. <laughs> a long time. Yeah, you know, we should be talking about the third film right now instead of the short film. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get that uh, we'll, we'll get that at some point. <laughs> so we did get a Spider Verse in March. It's just not the one everybody expected. <laughs> no, no. Ah, uh, man. And plus, besides, we just have too much going on tonight. We're going to talk about Shogun Episode Six, Ladies of the Willow World. Um, And I believe this is taken from IMDb. Uh, Lady Ochiba returns to Osaka in order to accelerate the region's campaign against Toronaga. In Ajor, Toronaga tests Mariko's loyalty to his cause. So, Will, um, essentially there's two halves of this episode. One half about Mariko and one half about Ochiba. Um, but let's start with Lady Ochiba since she's kind of the new character who's entering the fold. What did you think about everything that was going on? And I'm going to emphasize that pre- let's stick to also present day for the moment. Okay. But in present day Osaka um, with Lady Ochiba's return, um, Lord Ishiba, and um, just the overall the regents and what's the political things that are happening there. Yeah, so just sticking to the present day, I, I thought that this, this, the, really, this episode and, and, and focused, you know, it's called Ladies of the Willow World, and it was just a true testament to these are probably two of the most powerful women in Japan. Actually, three when you when you consider the courtesan, um, Lady um, uh, Kiku. 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 It really was that on display, I mean, it looked, uh, 
Ushida was definitely, uh, you know, she definitely returned to Osaka Castle with the power of being the one who bore the air for 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 the kingdom. And so I I just really looking at the present day and then all the stories that were going on, you know, within the castle uh, with the her influencing. Uh, Ashido, as far as trying to get the regents to uh, adopt a, a, a fifth member so that they could finally impeach Tornaga, everything, all the, all the political machinations that were going on really made for a very, uh, you, know, you know, you really recognize the force and that she is. And and then, of course, uh, as we learn more about why she is the way that she is, it, 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 she was a very compelling character. And definitely whenever we, you know, when we saw from the end of last week's episode, wondering how things were going to unfold, it, it definitely did not disappoint. So, yeah, um, I, I agree with you to an extent. I yeah. still, I don't, I like this character. I think she's a an important character to have. Um, she does so, definitely has a motivation. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. But there are two things that I have problems with. One, <laughs> it's still not really made clear to me how the mother, not the queen, not, not the person who was actually married to the previous emperor, but the mother of the heir has all of this power suddenly like mm-hmm. upon her return um to the point where it was mentioned several times in the episodes by the regents and the lords in osaka that they were basically being held hostage by this mm-hmm. woman yeah. but they never quite explained to me or at least i didn't i couldn't tell by what i was seeing and and understanding about why she held holds that, that power um over them and could could do that i mean i understand the manipulation of ishido but even he felt like even it seemed like he was being held hostage so i just i don't or maybe not or maybe that was a whole thing like he was basically her puppet so even though she would like was pushing him to move things along um he's the one who actually holds power it wasn't clear to me yeah, I mean, it, to me, it's very clear. I mean, Ashido is, he's just truly, he's not good at the political game. I mean, he, he, he right. thinks he, he, he thinks he is, but he's just, he's just the pawn. And I think where she gets a lot of her power is the simple fact that the Taiko had many courtesans Curtis, who were trying to sire him a male heir. And no one was able to do it, but she, as she said, she took, you know, she, what was it? She, by uh, compelling fate, um, I mean, she just kind of took the, took the thing on hand and, 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 and ripped his eyes out or something. I think I'm paraphrasing, but I mean, she was the one that was able to, 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 to keep the lineage going. And, you know, and, and so she, but because yeah. of that, she has a very special, you know, very special place in, in this in, you know, being that she is the mother to the heir to the Tycho. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess I would just like to understand more about why culturally that would be the case at this time. Well, because uh, in, in similar times and and similar stories, that's never the case. <laughs> so I just <laughs> I just I just culturally I want to understand that a little bit mm-hmm. more. Like I can see the importance of that position and and I and I will be honest I did not like the line about well I stared fate in the face and scratched his eyes out I'm like what 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 are we talking about here what kind of metaphor is this like like what do you mean <laughs> like I don't well, get it <laughs> yeah well whatever I guess I mean it was an arranged relationship so well yeah it's it's an arranged it's she was 
a handmaid, if we're going to yeah. go into handmaid's tale, like she was just there to have sex with him so that she could produce an heir because everyone else so far has failed and they needed someone. And so I get why she's upset. I understand that. Like, because, because it basically, there were a lot of implications that they drugged her. They, but they're, and I want to know, okay, so how much of it was actual rape? Because I, I think there was some part of it that was pretty much rape. Yeah. Yeah. And then on top of that, we get the flashbacks, which I knew right away for some reason that the, the girl who was playing with young Mariko in the flashback sequences was Lady Ochiba. Um, and who was, who was revealed at, at that time to also be the daughter of the um, ruler at that time, who we know that from previous episodes, Mariko's father kills that ruler, um, which leads to devastation for her, her own family. So, so, so Lady Ochiba is, she remains behind after her father is killed. And then she has to bear the child for his successor. Horrible situation. Just disgusting, just gross and all of that. Um, so, like I said before, that's one of the reasons why I can appreciate her character because all of the motivation is there for her doing what she's doing. Then the question is, well, and I'm, this is the one thing I can praise Lord Ishebe about. He asked the question I've been wanting to know. Why does she hate Tarnaga? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, cause people have to ask this question. Right, and right. then she explains that she believes that he is the one who actually had the plan. He did not commit the act. She knows mm -hmm. that, but he was the planner behind the series of events that led to her father's death. Okay. Well, we will, <laughs> I'll let you go. <laughs> will on share yeah. your thoughts about that. Um, yeah. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you went, you brought that up because I think that also plays a, a role in why she does have some of, you know, in, in addition to what we discussed as far as you know, siring the air, bearing the air to the, to the throne. Also, the fact that her father was a very powerful um, warlord, and also, you know, I think that also lends to her you know, having um, having some, you know, higher station uh, because of, because of her lineage. So, with the, with the assassination of her father. And and thinking that Tornaga was behind it, um, you know, it definitely, you know, you know, this the this character is based off, and, and all these characters are based off, you know, real people and real events that happen in in feudal Japan, mm -hmm. and and so uh, the person that he, that he's that her father's based off of was truly a very nasty, evil man, and many of the other uh feudal war feudal leaders were, were did want him gone and so many of the prominent nobles wanted him gone so yeah so it makes sense for her to figure out the feel to have this feeling that tornaga was definitely behind this uh even though it, it doesn't seem that tornaga um you know, orchestrated the plan he may have just been a part of it and just very happy that this guy is gone so that you know things you know that Things can sort of materialize how they should. It reminds when I whenever I was watching this whole dynamic and stuff between Marco and and Ochiba, especially when they were younger, it definitely I, I definitely was starting to was getting some House of the Dragon vibes with Alicent and Renea, um, and and and, and Alicent's like role as far as you know Marion Viserys, uh, because it was it, there, I did I did see some sort of similar parallels with their relationship and how their relationship ended up like fall into the wayside because of bigger, bigger issues of state. I did not think about them at all during yeah. this episode for some reason. Um, but I can see what you're getting at with those parallels. Yeah. Um, yeah to, to go back to what you were saying about Toronaga though, thank you for bringing that up because that was going to be my point. I think it's, 
it's interesting how in Osaka, um, Ochiba reveals that this is why she hates Tornaga. And all I'm thinking in my head is like, wait a second, let's rewind, go back to the Tornaga scene with Mariko. Tornaga is clueless <laughs> as to why you hate him. <laughs> so if if it, if they're going to say when all is said and done that no, Tornaga was behind it, then I'm just going to be like, okay, <laughs> Okay, flaw <laughs> because <laughs> because he would have and and it's hard for me to say oh there's absolutely no way just because of how the whole conversation goes with Mariko where he does talk about her father and why she was married off the way not the way but when she was but actually both to who and mm-hmm. when she was because he needed to get her out of there before everything unraveled around them. So it was yeah. a protection clause. Yeah. Some some could also argue with w- the way he was talking to her and um, given his closeness with her father that he definitely knew about the plan. Oh, yeah. But the, the actual orchestrator, I don't know. And maybe when Lady Ochoa says it, He's the only one she can kill at this point. You know, she's the only one she that the Tornaga, like she, t- for her to settle the score in her mind, he's got to go because he, he, he knew about it and yeah. he could have prevented it. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I, and, and, you know, maybe, I mean, I, I wrote fan fiction in episode one about this. But maybe so long ago, he she's also pissed because at one point she really liked him. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, and so and so I guess to go back to that first episode, it now makes more sense about why she was sent away because mm-hmm. he knew about her despisement when she, she was because he sent her away, and the air remained in Osaka. So, so maybe that's why, even though they don't really explain it in my opinion, but maybe that's why Lord Ishiba wanted her to return to Osaka because, well, if Toronaga wants her gone, then she must be of value um, for, for somebody who's against Toronaga, like an ally, the enemy of my enemy is my friend um, type of deal. But you got to take in consideration. Her dad was crazy. She's probably a bit crazy too. So exactly, exactly. And but also, and I guess that, that's the thing too. That even though, you know, and, and I guess that was part of the reason why Toronaga and the other other noblemen and pe- people wanted to, you know, wanted her father dead was because, um, you know, after that, uh, it did lead to the Tycho's. Rain. I mean, there was no more, no more war um, dur- during that during that period. Um, and so, and also, you know, the thing that really was, you know, was provided some clarity. And I know we were we were wondering, like, you know, as far as Mariko and 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 the, and the wedding and the timing and stuff. Uh, one other element that was that did get filled in this week was that. You know, Marco's father wanted her to live so that, that she could get that revenge one day. Um, so, you know, so everything, so it, it definitely like. Revenge on who? The, since honor demanded that the whole, her family had to like um, kill themselves because of her father's treason. Um, she wouldn't, you know, she would get her revenge on the people who like falsely accused her father of being being a treasonous person but he was he killed the lord he like he killed yeah but the yeah but the, the, and but everyone the, knew <laughs> but he, yes but the, he killed the lord because of the uh of Sheba's father was just he was a terrible a terrible man and and because of uh, because of that he was you know it was you know causing a lot of conflict and stuff so no, I understand all yeah. of that but I just don't buy that 
she's going to get revenge on the people who took, like, made her father kill themselves because, like, she wanted the way the culture is being explained to me. The noble thing to do would be to let her die. I mean, the person she could get revenge on would be her husband and killing Buntaro because he keeps commanding that she lives. But I don't I don't feel like she nef- necessarily has anyone that she needs to get revenge against. It's more like she well, needs Well, I mean it's, it's not necessarily just this one person. I mean there's probably a you know a, a many enemies that they all had because again these were all feuding feuding clans in 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 Japan at the time. So it's not just, I don't think it's just one like she's just not you know only like fighting against Ochiba's father. I mean, it's other probably other folks as well. Well, Ochiba's father is dead. Well, yeah, but I mean, there are other enemies. You know, like we saw the other four regents that are that are present that were sure. were, were, were I mean, around. So, but that see, there's also a time difference here. Like a lot of people profited from the death of her father, including Toronaga. All right, and now we're talking about two different people. Okay, so a lot of people profited from the death of Mariko's father because he was like the sacrificial lamb of saying, like, well, somebody has to go down for this. And for whatever reason, which, fingers crossed, maybe we get some more flashbacks and, like, flashbacks and more of this is explained, but it was Mariko's father who drew the shortest straw and is like, okay, so you and your family must die. Okay, so in my mind, as we discuss this further, hmm, why doesn't Mariko kill Tornaga? <laughs> <laughs> because, hey, hey, if 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 Ochiba is right and it was all Tornaga's idea, technically then that means that he manipulated her father to do his dirty work and she yeah. and her father would be living, like her whole life would be completely different if it wasn't for Tornaga. Yeah, but I don't see that's just, and I guess that gets to our point. I don't think that's ever going to happen, but I'm yeah, just saying. no, no, but I, but I also, I think it also answers one of our questions in that, uh, and what we've discussed is Tornaga probably wasn't the person that was the, the orchestrator of this plot. Yeah, but I don't, I have yet to see because he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be Shogun. I mean, he's made it clear that he doesn't, you know, he just. Thank you for bringing this up. Yeah. <laughs> this is another problem I had with this episode, and and. Before I continue, let me just say, I actually really like this episode. It's one of the stronger episodes, um, in my opinion. However, there, um, my favorite character, Toranaga, yeah. he said some stuff that isn't adding up to me. Like this whole, I don't want to be Shogun. And suddenly I'm looking at him and I'm thinking to myself, then what the heck are we watching? <laughs> what, what, what are you doing? You don't want this? Then, 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 why, why, why is this going on? <laughs> well, because, <laughs> because he, you know, he was loyal to the Taiko, the, the, you know, and and his goal, his, I think his ultimate goal, and even though Oshiba doesn't see it, Toranaga orchestra, you know, he he just wants the he wants her son to be able to take the throne, and that's his motivation. Well, see. That that that's wonderful, but <laughs> I don't get then why no one else is supporting that. <laughs> well, because everybody else has. I mean, you know, we know Ashido definitely. Um, he, he has his sights on things, and he, you know, and he can't like, you know, he can't strike down Oshiba and the and the son because if he does, then that will create will openly create war. So, you know, so he's, you know, he's doing all these, like, you know, he's trying to do this impeachment so that, um, you know, that will, that will remove, you know, he can say, I got cover by, by the, by the council of regents <laughs> that, you know, that, that Tornaga should be, should be gone. And, and I think Oshiba is, well, you know, is, is, is supportive of that because, I mean, she blames Tornaga for the death of her father. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, um, we'll see. We'll see yeah. what, what more motivations or 
lack of motivations reveal itself. Um, it's just, this is again why Yabo Shige is my favorite character. <laughs> because yeah. he's the one who I know exactly, A, his motivation. Mm-hmm. You can't trust him. Love nope. that. Love that transparency. Yep. Can't trust you. I get it. I get it. Yep. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the he's all, he's got, very confusing. <laughs> yeah. Never should get definitely like, you know, he, he knows at some point he's going to, you know, he's going to die on a battlefield somewhere because even this episode, he was like, I need to draw up a wheel. <laughs> I need to- yeah, right. He had, he was barely in this episode, but he was the only one. I, I love how he talks to Ami. He's like, what? Who cares about what the barbarian is being rewarded right now? Yeah. We are about to enter a war that we can't win. And we got mm-hmm. our lives, like, like we got to figure out a way out of this. Like, that survivalist mentality. I can respect that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which Omni just is, is there complaining because... Um, Blackthorn takes over the cannon regimen, um, mm-hmm. and then later on in the episode, he also is offered the opportunity to hook up with Omni's um, courtesan, Kiku, yep. Lady Kiku. Um, so what what did you think about the miracle of it all? Yeah, her story this week was just equally very compelling. I mean, the... Because, you know, she and Blackthorn had, you know, she's she, she's now she's like she's only treating him as her as you know, his interpreter, nothing more. But, you know, everybody, everybody there in, at, at the camp knows that something's going on between them and and to see how, you know, Tornagas, you know, sees it, um, you know, there was her her husband sees it and hide that i guess what was the the eightfold um eightfold. yeah i mean that that we're seeing that at play here uh as, as things progress in in the series so it, she, she really it again like i said you know sheba maybe is the powerfulest woman in in, in japan but marco's like right but right there not far behind because of where where she is positioned with all these things going on we we do have two episodes of a different show to talk about so i don't know how much i want to argue with you um (laughs) (laughs) um, so so i'm so i'll just say if mariko was really good with the whole practice of the eightfold fence then why the heck does everybody know that she's loved and probably has had sex with blackthorn so i'm gonna say no no Say she messy. I'm not saying she's good she's at it. I'm messy. just saying she. Yeah, I'm just she's saying she's so messy. Yeah, and I'm just saying that she thinks she's good at it. I mean, she's good at she's playing that game, but everybody else sees it. Yeah. Then, then, then I, I guess then I just don't understand why you would say she's so powerful because if she's playing a game but she's sloppy at it, she's not doing that great. Well, she, the, she, I don't. I don't say that she's as powerful as you're saying she is. I think she is a good ally for Tornaga yeah. and someone who I yeah. I think because he hates his son right now. Yeah. Like he wishes like that was her daughter or his daughter. Yeah. Um so so I understand all that, but I don't yeah. think she's that powerful. But then again, well, Rewind everyone. I didn't think that I still question the power that's coming from Lady Ochebe. I think Lady Ochebe just has a lot of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think well, and, 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 and you fleshed out what I meant by power. I mean, I think that her her power is in that she the, the her what her her role with Tornaga and 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 also um, I but guess the interface. Get, she even gets scolded in this episode. Because she, she gets sent, she gets scolded and punished because she gets sent to go and basically watch Blackthorn have sex with Lady Cuckoo. Like yeah, but, that was the whole thing. And then she acts very unprofessional and mistranslates yeah. the offer to go with them. Um, and she must stay behind, which I just would like to say my favorite scene in this entire episode is actually the the saying of the Lord's Prayer yeah, in both same. Japanese and English simultaneously. 
Yeah, she was praying. Yeah, she was. Uh, it was, it was like, yeah, I think it was actually Latin. That's why he recognized it. Because of, because of, she's she was saying it because she's Catholic. So yeah. oh, she's saying it in Latin. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and that's why he recognized I did it. Not hear that. At all. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, well. Either way, to yeah, but it was a powerful scene. Frame that shot. Yeah. Um, and just how the execution was so good. And then to have the translation or miss whatever you want to call it between Lady Kiku and um, Mariko at the end. Great scene. The actor who plays Blackthorn did an amazing job with his eyes in that um, whole sequence um, yeah. because he was very captivated and all of his emotions was written on his face. So hats off to them. Um, yeah. So, so despite me like questioning power of these women, this overall episode is very strong because of those two scenes and a few others as well. Yeah. Um, and and it's just good to see multiple characters start to get fleshed out. Yeah. Um, even though I wish some motivations would be explained a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, though, as far as the two most powerful scenes, because, I mean, I think that whenever they were saying the Lord's Prayer, I mean, it just it just showed that intimacy. I mean, you know, that they when he heard um, when she was when she was praying and, and it re again, reinforces that. And then the when they were in the Willow uh, world at the, at the at the brothel and. Uh, the three of them in in the room, and and just to even not only the eyes, but also like whenever he was going to go get pillowed, and you know he reaches out with his hand, and like they brush hands too, and, and that scene that was just between the words and everything about those those two scenes were just really really powerful this week. Right, and I like how um, the first scene is actually intimacy through pain because mm -hmm. they were saying those that prayer um admits all of the losses that had occurred with the earthquake and yeah. then at the end it's um pain through almost pleasure and seduction yeah. and all of that um so it's interesting to see both sides of intimacy and affection display so yeah, yeah. we will continue next week with shogun episode seven that brings us to our new show that we will start covering, Three Body Problem. Lord, I am so sorry to all of the listeners who have been listening to us for a few weeks and anytime I mention this, because I swear to God, Will never corrected me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I referred to it as Three Bodies, One Problem. <laughs> so long. I just, and yeah. <laughs> it's called Three Body Problem. We watched the first two episodes. Do we understand why it's called Three Body One Problem or Three Body Problem? No, not a clue. But yeah. <laughs> so let, let us start with episode one, Countdown. Unsettling events put a group of brilliant friends on, an, on edge as a mystery unravels with origins tracing back to China during the Cultural Revolution. Will, what did you think about this first episode? Oh, I, so this first episode really, it, it started out the way that it did in 1966 and, and the height of the cultural revolution in China. I was not expecting that at all. No, um, God, no. It, yeah. And, and just, and so it, it really set the stage, this first episode overall, this really sort of set the stage for the series you know, introducing us all to the characters, um, the production values, the sound, everything about it, the storytelling was really, really cool. I know from what I understand, the, this scene actually that where things started out in the in the book written by uh, Lee Sho, um, it was actually in the middle, but whenever they translated it to English, just they actually flipped the order. Um, but it, it, it you know it, it really like set the tone as far as like all the things that proceeded afterwards with you know with science with religion with um we see ye wenji in the in the crowd seeing her father get executed and and how the mother like you know 
um, just stood there and was the one who who flipped and turned him in. So, you know, right at the outset, we get the a, a three body problem where there's equal, you know, where the, with these three people and the events are are tugging against one another. Not even getting into the fact that this is about, you know, what the what we learned at the end of the episode as far as what was the the mission here. But, um, you know, set those things up. And then, of course, we do fast forward to our, our, you know, so we get the one body and we get the second body with the folks and, you know, in London and. and Oh, so you're going to try to explain to me what the title means. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, that, is that I, what we're doing here? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I just, I just, I just, I, it I dawned just, on I me know. whenever I was watching, you know, this is such a vague title. It just had it dawned on me, like, what, you know, the. So, who the, are the three bodies? Well, at least in the first episode, at least to me, it seems to be. Change? Huh? <laughs> no, continue. I'm just going to yeah. let you finish your yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, no, but I, yeah, like I said, I just really set things up really, really well. So what, what are your thoughts on it? I, I don't want to ramble. I, well, I'm now rambling. I want to know what, who, I want to understand who you're, th- like you said something dawned on you. So, okay, so when G is the first body, who's the second body? Well, her family is, and, you know, and, and Vera, I mean, uh, you know, that. So that's one unit. The, 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 the Oxford Five is the second one, and then Clarence is the third. At least as far as the people. Sorry, I feel like I'm doing like math in my head. It ain't adding up to three, but no, but no, not can... not not three literal, like three. No, not not literally three people, like three units. And that's why it's body instead of bodies. <laughs> well, I mean the three. Well, I mean the second. The second episode really gets into like the three other three bodies, the celestial I'm so bodies. But, you know. as what counts as a body and what doesn't. Um, this is an excellent way to uh, to for us to be talking about this show because this show, honestly, everyone, you just have to watch it. You have to sit down. You have to watch it. Um, I was surprised by how engaged I was throughout the entire two episodes. I think I fast forward through one scene because I didn't really care about watching two characters have sex. Um, and but overall, I was I was really pleased. Um, so yeah. So as Will was saying, we we meet Wen J, um, E Wen J, Wen G in um the past at the very beginning and then fast forward to the present day um where her daughter kills herself like right off the bat (laughs) um and that's vera's death which leads us to the oxford five i'm just as i'm talking i'm trying to figure out a way to both review and explain what's going on Um, But all I really want to say is that overall with this episode and the next episode, every time I had a thought of a question or an inkling of, wait a second, this isn't adding up. This logically isn't making any sense. What is going on? I felt as though the writers could hear me and instantly the next scene, my question was answered. Hmm. And not in a way that I was expecting. Um, so for example, I want to say it's in the first episode that we meet, um, Augie meets Angelique. I think that's what her name is. At least that's what IMDB tells me she is. Um, and it's because Augie is seeing these visions and then suddenly she ends up taking a smoke and can't, can't light her cigarette and Angelique is there. And I'm like, where the heck did you come from? (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah yeah so so that's my thoughts see now i'm rambling i don't know how to talk about this show i really don't (laughs) well i was trying yeah it's okay (laughs) i was trying to set it up but yeah i mean it's um i mean it's a lot going i mean it's there's there's a really i think it's like i think the easiest way to do it is like really talk about the three different the different units because like i was surprised in this episode how a we started in China in 19 in the 1960s but then we go to present day and I'm thinking oh we're gonna be here for a while but over the course of that first episode 
we go back to Wenji's yeah. story. Yeah. Um, and and we find her at a work camp um, where she's she's working, and then she gets kind of screwed over again. Um, but then the military realize that she can be of use to them, and they send her to the top of the hill where she, at the end of the episode, we learn about what this army research facility is really doing, and it's called the Red Coast Project, um, which she, after a demonstration that kills a lot of birds, a lot yeah. of birds die, um, it, was, it was basically a sequence from the birds that occurred, um, she, she points out like, oh, this isn't, you guys aren't building a weapon. You're actually building a way to communicate yeah. with aliens, <laughs> 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 um, which like overall the, I, I was surprised by just how much the past mystery um it it complements what's going on in present day so well like yeah. like it it's not a parallel it's not taking you out it it doesn't like these stories yes you, you when she's in both present day and past um mm -hmm. but you're learning information and it and it also they don't repeat themselves necessarily <laughs> No. Or to the point where you're just like, man, why, why we get it, we understand. You, both timelines are are you're being informed as characters are being informed because really, when Jay has some explaining to do in present day, she got some explaining to do mm -hmm. in present day. So, and we'll get to the second episode and where she leaves things. But so while all of that is playing out in past. In present day, we meet the Oxford Five, which you were saying was our body number two. Yes. <laughs> so, um, w what about so Vera? Vera's death kicks off our introduction to the Oxford Five, to Saul, um, Augie, um, Jin, and a few others. Um, so, so what did you take about these five like college nerd friend group people? Yeah, so I overall, I mean, really saw Augie and Jen really the were the three that stood out for me. Will and uh, Jack, uh, you know, Jack, I was annoyed by Jack, to be honest. Uh, I just, I don't know, was there something about, I mean, I know this is, I, th I know that was probably the intent of him to be an annoying character, but. Um, you know, I think it, it it just really did a good job of just sort of setting up the, the, the dynamic between the two, between the group, friend group, and uh, we, you know, we, we, you know, as they're, when they're at Vera's front funeral, we, um, you know, we learn uh, thing, you know, that Jen and Will, for example, you know, did have a prior relationship, Augie and Saul, I, I think it seems like they're on again, off again. Um, but you know it, it they are, are are really trying to they're trying to figure out what's going on because saul you know the night that uh vera commits suicide i mean she you know they the, they, they realize that the physics something's going you know the data is just like showing nonsense and and they're, they're trying to figure out this this mystery as far as what's going on and why all the why all the particle accelerators around the planet are 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 having having difficulty so uh well, that's, uh, that's what saul is trying to figure out yeah 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 that's what saul's trying to figure out augie you know she starts to you know she starts to see the the countdown clock countdown. Um, and you know and then and and then she bumps into the mysterious person there on the steps and you know and and he, you know and, and when clarence like you know sees you know, whenever he you know, sees later in the episode, we see where, you know, when he talks to Augie about this, he, you know, he, or was that the second episode? That was, that, second episode. that was the second episode. Yeah, second episode. But, yeah. but, what, you're, yeah. but what you're getting at yeah. is so, the, like, there's a reason why those three out of the five of them stuck out because they really focused on Saul's 
connection or not connection, but the fact that Saul was working on the same project, the same science project that Vera did and Vera ends up killing herself. Um, Jin, she, she really isn't, nothing too odd is happening. She's kind of the normal friend for both like Saul and, and Augie. Um, I guess that's a way to articulate her storyline actually comes in the second episode um, when Wenji gifts her something from Vera. Yeah. But and and she starts to question, why did Vera quit call herself? Which, you know what? Why aren't they all questioning this? Mm-hmm. Um, Augie is suffering from visions, the countdown clock, which you mentioned. And so I I can uh, I also really appreciate how there are a lot of characters. Mm-hmm. And this is a big, complicated mystery. Yet, each character, like, it's not like the Scooby gang. Right. <laughs> it's really not. They all have their own lives. They all also are experiencing very different things and are coming, are, are folded into this overall story in very different ways. So it doesn't get boring and you don't feel as though you're watching the same story be told five times. Yeah. So I I can I really like how only one of them had the countdown clock. Now, I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't know why. Also, obviously, Vera at one point had the countdown clock to go on. But why didn't Saul, you know, yeah. um, why didn't Jin? So so it, it's it's interesting that. Um, I hope we come to understand more about what exactly was it about Augie's research that led to her being the one of the five that had that. Um, And to go into Clarence, who I'm assuming is your third body, um, because Will is on body count right now. Um, he, He, we are introduced at the very beginning in present day. Um as an investigator who's looking into a researcher who pulled out his own eyes and and used blood to write out a countdown. Basically, the countdown clock made him go crazy. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Which we were starting to see Augie experience as well. So 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 we understand. Um and and he is really the one in in the present day besides Wen Jay. Wenji, um, who has been looking into investigating why there are so many researchers who, out of nowhere, inexplicably are killing themselves. Um, and so he's trying to to really understand this bigger mystery. Um, and so we get all of that in the first episode. Yeah. 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 The second episode is called uh, Red Coast, and um, it's described as Augie's countdown jeopardizes her nanotech work. Jin becomes engrossed in an other otherworldly VR game. Yi Wenji follows through on a radical idea. Um. So, so Will, what were your ta- what was your take on the Jin VR game? Um, storyline that also ends up including Jack as well. Um, I, I at this point I'm st- I'm just trying to figure out like how this is how does it fit all into to this larger story? Um, mm-hmm. and 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 you know one character we didn't talk much we didn't get we didn't get into much um with the first episode but it's a very pivotal character that um that we. Lee Wenji met in Mongolia was uh, Mike Evans. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and 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 while she was in the labor camp, uh, the journalist that she met gave her a copy of the book uh, Silent Spring, uh, which is which is a real book uh, uh, that uh, really was was written in the '60s and very was um, uh, very pivotal in like telling how pesticides like DDT and other things were, were poisoning on the planet. So. Um, you know, so and it, but but you know, so of course, whenever Evans was there in Mongolia, and it was he was trying to like you know, stop all the deforestation and stuff. You know, fast forward to present day, now he's like big industrialist and anti-vaxxer, anti you know, 
anti-science, et cetera, you know, very wealthy industrialist. Um, and so I'm wondering if his company is possibly behind this, this VR game, because I mean, yes, we learned at the end of the first episode, they're looking, you know, the, the, the Chinese were, were looking for, um, aliens with the transmissions and stuff but it does i don't know I, I can't see how at least at this juncture in the story how the aliens would know to like drop a vr game like this so um so i'm wondering if he's behind it or if it's some you know for something or something completely unrelated i, I just don't really know it, but it, but the things that were going on in that universe really seemed to be it it wasn't clear to me because like I, at first i thought the game the vr thing was attuned to like the individual user like it was programmed you know for for a person especially to like the way things sort of unfolded between that was the difference with jack and and jen right um but then i was like but that, that doesn't make sense because vera's mom gave her you know gave jen vera's old gaming set so that, you know, so I was like, I threw that theory out the window. And then Jack later gets his on his own, like, you know, VR set. So, I, like I said, I, right. I, yeah. I think you're right in the sense of what you were initially thinking. Because even though uh, Vera's mom, when Jay gave her, gave Jen Vera's, mm -hmm. um, the the first person you encounter in the game didn't kill her. So, right there that was taken as some sort of invitation because yep. jack when he puts it on immediately gets killed yep. and and i have to say i disagree with will i love jack partially <laughs> because the actor who plays him samuel tarley game of thrones so i'm just saying yeah. my loyalty yeah. is jack <laughs> he um he he can't use that same one and and then when he gets his own there are a few subtle changes in the game itself Mm -hmm. And it does feel more like, okay, now he's invited to play. I think, like, I did not think about that, but I think you're spot on with Mike um, Evans possibly being behind the game in conjunction with Wenjay, which mm -hmm. my biggest thing about present day Wenjay, and I hope, like, as the season progresses, we understand more about is she's in my opinion she's in clear cahoots with the aliens okay mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she's in cahoots but her daughter dies yeah so what what what's up with that <laughs> <laughs> what what happened there also who's her dad her daughter's father I'm just saying yeah yeah, that, <laughs> that, that was my thing too. I was like, I wonder if so, if you know, because she did hook up, you know, she did have a, yeah. a pillow with the uh, with the journalists there in the camp. So the time would probably be about right. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just, I see. I don't, I don't think it was a journalist. I don't, I don't think. I think it might be the engineer who, um, like, they have more of an antagonistic relationship <laughs> with. <laughs> and then my theory is also Mike Evans. Um, Mike Evans, uh, yeah, I'll say yeah. yeah, yeah. I have, I have that theory going on. So, but, but, and why it's very clear is because this episode, spoiler alert ends with her sending a communication because they finally figure out how they can use the sun to amplify the message and she sends a communication because mike interferes i'm pretty sure it's mike who's interfering with the call um that because they pick up a single and when jay translates it and says do not answer i'm a pacifist if you answer we will come and conquer your world like I'm not delusional. That was from Mike, right? Like it's just it's weird to me how how he he can like I don't know the fact that they say he's a pacifist and they just had that encounter and then this single is going out. So in response, she sends out a, a um, another message that says, "Come." We cannot save ourselves, and I will help you 
conquer this world. So the lady chose her ally. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, fuck y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I, and, I, and that goes back to what I was, you know, trying to say at the beginning with the politics of it all, because she, you know, she she, she sees this, this world as, you know, she the politics, you know, she runs into the poli- the, the young the lady who, like, beats her father to death in, in, the, in the square, you know, in the labor camp. Mm-hmm. And... And, you know, so you have all that and, and, you know, she, she's got this book and, you know, what she's been through with, with, with her own ordeal, getting sentenced, sentenced to the labor camp and, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, whenever she said that, when she, you know, when they had, they showed her pause her finger and I was just like, she's going to do it because she's got all the motivations in the world to like, come fuck this place up. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because. I don't feel like they are fucking it up. What what's going on in present day is more of a warning. It's like yeah. you shall not advance like to the point where you could come and take over our world. So it's almost like this alliance of okay, you don't conquer us, but you also help us prevent from getting that knowledge and that advancement in technology to even become a potential threat. Mm -hmm. Um, Because with Augie, that's what we really learned. She's given a simple choice. Either either let the countdown clock get to zero, which you won't like what would happen. Right. um, Or give up, stop your research. Mm -hmm. And and we see it where she she ends up stopping the research, clock disappears. And then Clarence just so happens to be like sitting outside of the street, which uh, was one thing where I was like, okay, how did he know? But then again, we also see him spying on practically everybody this episode. Yep. So yep. I guess, but I don't know. Um, so, and he starts to fill her in on potentially what really is going on or his full investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's, it's interesting how it's not even, it doesn't feel like they want to conquer. It's more of you shall not become a threat. Yeah. Um, and and I think that's probably because of some allies that they have, like a Mike Evans and like a E Wen J. So, but we shall we shall learn more. I mean, we're just this is crazy. We're just getting yeah. started. Yeah, and yeah. what I really love, I can't emphasize this enough about the show and having watched these first two episodes. There's a huge ass mystery, but mm-hmm. I feel like I'm given, I've been given a ton of information. Yeah. Yeah. But I not agree. to where like, oh, well, it's so obvious. It's like, well, they're hinting, but nothing's for certain. Like in the in the VR game, towards the end, one of the last VR sequences that are actually pretty cool because it allows them to give us really cheesy, low mm-hmm. budget graphics. But it makes sense. <laughs> it feels so cheesy. Um, but there's a scene towards the end where Jin ends. Um, it's right before she finishes the first round. And she kind of fails. But they allow her to proceed um, with with trying to save the, the, the next civilization. Um, because she succeeds by proving that. Um, what does she prove, Will? Let's see. In the first one, she proves that you know, because the first one they were using chance and religion to like you know the, the superiority the, of science over yeah. mythic mythic mysticism, mythic, yeah, mysticism, yeah. And um, and at one point, I think the emperor shouts and says, "Science on what on on which world?" And right there, I was like, yeah, the aliens are so behind this game. (laughs) Because, and I go back to what Saul was saying in the first episode. um, And what was said a few times by, I think, all of Oxford Five. This doesn't, isn't making sense based on our laws of physics. But those laws of physics can be applied in a different world and make complete sense. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really interesting. So it's almost like, okay, if we take that piece of information, why is Winjay allowed to make friends with the aliens? Well, maybe they try 
to apply their laws of physics. And even though they're advanced, some of their stuff, their technology doesn't work here mm-hmm. because we have different laws of physics. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Very, I mean, it's, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, 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 you're right. I mean, there's just so, there was just so much to digest in these first two episodes, uh, setting the table for what we'll, what we'll get in the remaining six, but also, um, but, but also just questions that it poses. And, uh, you know, and we didn't even get into like, you know, with whatever, you know, we had the universe blinking <laughs> there at the end of in the episode one with Augie and Saul sitting there. Um, I guess they were at Cambridge, I guess, whenever sure. she was in the courtyard. They were at a um, university. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, but then, of course, you know, the next episode, you know, to your point, like, there was no like you know the universe blinked and then you know you, you see you're seeing it's bbc like news story about you know the thing happening but then all the satellites didn't pick it up right so did it really so you know did it yeah i guess it happened <laughs> but but there's no like proof beyond people's observations that that it did so i mean it just really you know and then and then uh, I think even the Tatiana, I think her name, the, you know, she shows up with Augie, but then she also later shows up, you know, at Clarence whenever he's in the cemetery, uh, yeah. just randomly bumps into, you, you know, randomly, air quote, you know, whenever he's, you know, leaving the cupcake for his, for his deceased wife. Yeah. And, and, you know, so these, all these, you know, these, these encounters that are, that are happening and, um, you know, and then she, you know, I think in the first episode, she, what, huh? Sorry, but why do you think Tatiana chose to um, encounter, have that encounter with Clarence? Because based my read, that's the first time he's ever seen her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I guess, I mean, she, she clearly is like, because, you know, he, you know, whatever Augie you know, since he is surveilling everyone, he, you know, Augie he, he is sitting there, you know, whenever they see the, the CCTV. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, he, he, he doesn't see her in that he doesn't. Yeah, but he knows that she exists. Well. Because, well, he knows something happened. But he believes Augie. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I guess, I, you know, I don't know if, she, if she's like maybe one of the aliens or or something else where she just you know because you know she, maybe she's like the watcher or something or observer i mean i never right. read the book so i don't you know so i don't know how this is going to play out at all okay. so um and, and which which i just was curious if you had some sort yeah. of theory going on yeah. about yeah, why I mean, that yeah. interaction occurred because it was very different it was also very different interaction than hers with augie Mm-hmm. Um, for a multitude of reasons, yeah. um, but but I thought I was like, okay, so potentially that could be a sign that his investigation is actually starting to scratch the surface of what's really going on. Yeah, um, yeah. and he might start to pose a threat in a different way that is very different from the scientists mm-hmm. um, who are suffering from the countdown clock, yeah. um, but. But yeah, I, you know, it's it's a lot. It's it's a dense show, but I can't. I just am gonna say it again. Honestly, it. I don't feel like we are given too much information at the same time. It's just, it's just a very well written show, yeah. where you feel like there's a lot. But it doesn't feel like oh wow I have to sit with this and really really figure out and I have to rewatch it. I'm like, no, 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 no. You, you get just enough information Mm -hmm. to feel as though you're following, but you're not, you're not given too much information to feel like you're too far ahead of what's going on because, Hey, I feel like we're about as in the know as Augie is at this point, maybe Jen Saul has no idea what's going on. Neither does Will. And arguably Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's just Jack, Jack's just having fun, you know, in his little view. When he got his, when he finally got his VR headset, he was and, and, and is able to play it. He's like, okay, 
Yeah, you know? but it's funny whenever he was in there too, because you know, so when he saw Sir Thomas More, he was <laughs> he was thinking he was gonna get sliced down again and you know he kept he was you know beating up the beating him up. So <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, Will, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you? Well, X formerly known as Twitter. Sorry, I can't even talk anymore. But uh at Will M Polk, W I L L M P O L K. And you can find, follow me there too at SJ Belmont, S J B E L M O N T. Please follow our crew on Twitter at Scene and Nerd. Friend us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and threads at Scene underscore N underscore Nerd. And visit our website, www.sceneandnerdpodcast.com. But most importantly, rate, follow, and comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Good night, geek out. You're welcome. <laughs>